Samuel chapter 19. We are looking at the life of David. We're working through 1 Samuel. And looking particularly at David's heart. And last week we covered David's courageous heart when David was facing Goliath and he overcame through the name of the Lord because he knew his God. And this week we'll find out what happens next and we'll be contrasting David's heart this week next week with what David's heart became next week. So David was, had had a mountaintop experience. Let's just find the page. What's the page in the Bible? 343. Three, three. Anybody want one? 1 Samuel 19. Last week we were in 1 Samuel 17. <clears throat> David defeated Goliath. <clears throat> and the girls sang songs about it. They thought David was terrific. They really um, wanted to put him on a pedestal and say, that David, you know, we want all our men to be like him. He's great. And David didn't let it go to his head. He just stayed quiet in his spirit and he knew what God had said. In chapter 16, God had sent Samuel to anoint David and say, you are going to be the next king. And he did it in a secret place where Saul, the present king, couldn't derail it and couldn't try and um, didn't know about it. But then Saul had this encounter with Goliath and defeated him and people could see that he was somebody that was anointed by God. But David was very keen that it should all be done in God's time. And he didn't want to try and go further than God was letting him to go. He, said, he, he must have said to himself, and he, in fact he said to Saul, Saul was so jealous of David, uh, and yet he publicly had to be uh, praising him because he'd done such an amazing thing. And he thought, I know, I'll give her my daughter in marriage, and then she'll bring trouble for him. And David said, oh, I'm, I'm not important enough to be your son-in-law. Uh, he was still very humble, you see. And then by chapter 19, Saul has realized that um, his daughter loves David, and she's not going to cause him all the problems he thought he would, and he wants to kill him. So, I want you to imagine, when you've been to a, have you ever been to a fairground and you've seen one of those things, it's like a tall thing with a, um, and you've got a red button at the bottom and you get a hammer, and you bang on the red hammer and the red line goes up to the top and dings the bell if you're strong enough. I want you to imagine a fearometer a fearometer, and if you have the fear of the Lord and you have a good heart and you're humble, then you stand on the fearometer and it goes ding up to the top, and you you be like Jesus really. Um, he really feared the Lord and he had a soft heart towards God. He made sure he met with Him every day, and he walked with Him all the time. He always did what God said, and he. On, if he stood on the fearometer, it would go right to the top. But Saul, if Saul, King Saul, stood on the fearometer, it would hardly go up at all. Because he was willing to break God's commandments. You know the Ten Commandments that God set? And because of his jealousy of David, Saul was willing to break one of the commandments, probably more in order to damage David and kill him. So the girls idolized him, put him on a pedestal. Saul was jealous of him and wanted to kill him. And Jonathan, Saul's son, loved David and he wanted to be a good friend to him and to protect him. And through all this, David kept his eyes on the Lord and he kept his heart right with God, 
and he kept his heart right with the people. And that is something that we have got to do. Whatever is going on for us, if people idolize us, if they hate us, are jealous of us, want to destroy us, or if people are with us, standing with us, and saying, I'm for you, we still keep our eyes on the Lord. Let's read chapter 19, or some of it anyway. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David and warned him, my father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning, go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more, war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But a, an un, injurious spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his hand, house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing his harp, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took a, an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, he's ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was an, the idol in the bed and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told me, told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? Then David had fled and made his escape. He went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went, back, went to Nioth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Nioth at Ramah. So after this, David tried to kill him twice now, and he is almost playing hide and seek. David runs away, and every time Saul sees where he is, he goes and chases after him, and then David has to run away again. And uh, we can't read all the story. There's some really interesting bits in that section. Uh, we've got where, in chapter 20, where it becomes clear that Jonathan has been helping David. And Saul is so angry at Jonathan trying to help David that he tries to kill him as well, his own son. Uh, or he's, he threatens to. He, he heard, hurled a spear at his son. That's in chapter 20, verse 33. And it's like something has taken hold of Saul, which is really evil. <coughs> So, how does David respond to this? First of all, David escapes. David knows that if he is anointed by God to do this thing, to become king, that he should not try and make it happen by himself. He should wait for the Lord to let steps unfold and gradually bring it about in his time, in his way. Maybe the Lord has given you a promise and it's not happened yet. But you are determined to do it God's way. Keep your heart right before God and let God bring about what he chooses 
what he anoints you for to bring about. That's good. We're going to skip over 20 and 21 and 22, but it's more of David running away and Saul pursuing. And a whole load of people get killed because of David going to them for refuge. In chapter 22, a whole load of priests get killed. But David is still keeping his heart right. He's getting out of the way. He's still trusting God. He's still strengthening himself in God. Jonathan originally helped him to strengthen his heart in God. He was such a good friend. And then David had to be on his own. And he had to strengthen himself in God. By the time we get to chapter 24, we're going to read a little bit of this just to see how David's doing. Because David's had some severe and extreme provocation by now. Chapter 24. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. So when David stands on the fearometer, it goes really close to the top, if not hits the top. David has a really soft heart towards the Lord. He's got a really tender conscience that he knows that because he cut off the corner of Saul's robe when he came within his hands, he could have so easily killed him and everybody else was saying, kill him, kill him, kill him. And he said, no, I fear God more than I am being persuaded by what you say. And it might seem a little thing. Just cut his robe. I mean, you didn't kill him, did you, David? But to David, that was wrong. Because he knew that it indicated a heart attitude that was saying, I will will do him some damage. So he got really close to the top of the fearometer, nearly close to the ding the top but because he repented I think maybe it got there but what as God has been showing me that it's in the little things that he's calling for us to be very sensitive to him when it's the outward things when it's the things on the show then we can get away with thinking we're really good people But when it's the little things, the conscience, the voice of your conscience, when was the last time your conscience either told you to do something or not to do something and you just skirted by that and you didn't really listen to your conscience? You kind of pushed it down and you made some excuse, some reason why you should be able to do the thing or or shouldn't have to do the thing. (laughs) exactly but this is what God is teaching us this morning is he looks at the the heart he looks at the little things in our lives and when we repeatedly go against our conscience we actually damage our conscience and we stop listening so God stops being able to use that so much 
what is a conscience anyway? Would anybody like to say, what is your conscience? Holy Spirit's involved. In fact, Paul... Yes, it's the voice inside telling you what you should and shouldn't be doing. Yep, and that, that can co- be this, you know, go along with the Holy Spirit. There's a really good, um, some, lots of good verses in uh, which I looked up doing this. And um, one of them says, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and my conscience. And uh, he, Paul encourages Timothy to listen to his conscience and, listen and have faith and a good conscience, he says. It's your sense of right and wrong. And we all know that different cultures have different senses of right and wrong. Um, And so we need to also be trained by the word of God, don't we? Yes. Yes, great. My spirit testifies with your spirit and the Lord has written these words on my heart. So you've got spirit, you've got word, You've got conscience, all these different things which all interact with each other. And if you ignore your conscience, then in the end, if you repeatedly ignore it over a thing, then it it's, um, makes that unavailable to you. You, you destroy it. Um, let's see if I can find the... No, I've lost the... Um, we're going to have a, a nice um, PowerPoint, but I'm not going to have it after all. So some, 1 Corinthians 8, 7, some are so accustomed to idols, their consciences are weak and defiled, says Paul. And he says in 1 Timothy 1, 19, we have to hold on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. And another thing is that conscience is not God. Paul, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 4, my conscience is clear, but does that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. And if there is a conflict between conscience and what the Lord says in his word and by his spirit, then we just, we put them in order. You know, the Lord is the Lord. Our conscience is great, it's a useful tool, but it's not God. But God does want us to uh, use our consciences, our consciences to be available to us, and he wants us to renew our mind in the word so that our consciences are really sharp And that was great about David, that his conscience was so sharp that he, um, even cutting Saul's robe was too much for his conscience. At this point in his life, like in the last song, David was a really hard place. And in our lives, when we are feeling dependent on God, when we are in need, that is a place where often our consciences are really good. They're working well for us and they're strong for us because we don't rely on ourselves. We're just looking at God for what he's saying. We'll see next week that David is in a completely different place and his conscience has been destroyed. But I won't steal the thunder of Alan, who's coming next week, to talk about it. But I think the Lord wants us to listen to him now and just to think about your conscience and the fear of the Lord. If you stood on the fearometer, would the line go all the way to the top? Go ding! Actually, if you stood on the fear of the Lord, you'd have to admit, well, I've been disobedient so many times. I've kind of lost the fear of the Lord. I've lost my love of the Bible reading. I've lost my love of prayer. And I'm just kind of, I'm going along with it. It's an outward show, but even I can't fool myself. Sometimes I try and fool myself, but when God gets me quiet inside, then I know I've lost the fear of the Lord, either to a great extent or to a small extent. So let's be honest with ourselves this morning, because the Lord wants to restore that fear of the Lord to us. How do we get the fear of the Lord then? Let's see if I can find where I've got my answers. How do you get the fear of the Lord? Who would like to say? 
Anybody want to suggest how we increase our fear of the Lord, which is going to enliven our conscience? Reading the Bible is one, because then you get the, the word and you realize what it is that God actually wants. Yeah, great. Yes, guard your hearts. If people say good things, if people praise you, a man is tested by the praise he receives. Or if they're really negative towards you and they hate you or they're trying to make things bad for you, you guard your heart. And that is your means you're looking at God rather than people around. And that's really great for the fear of the Lord. Yep. You have to forgive. So important, isn't it, um, to forgive. Yeah, and that's part of our obedience, being obedient. Listening to your conscience, going along with your conscience. The Bible, sorry? Say that again. Beholding the Lord with holy reverence. Absolutely. The way that, the best way is to uh, encounter God. When we encounter God, and David encountered God out in the fields before he killed Goliath, he encountered God out in the fields when he was running from Saul. And so he was uh, full of the fear of the Lord. The Proverbs says, If you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ears to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And understanding is not just about head knowledge, is it? It's about living it. It's about knowing it. It's about eating it and walking with it. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. That's Proverbs 1 and Proverbs 2. A beginning of Proverbs 2, most of that. So not only does the fear of the Lord... Uh, It it makes us more obedient. It it all works in a virtuous circle, doesn't it? Secondly, another way, how do you get the fear of the Lord? Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. So when our hearts are divided, we partly want to follow the Lord and we partly want to do what someone else thinks or what our flesh wants. But when we we decide, no, I'm not going to have that, I'm going to follow the Lord only, and we are completely yielded to him, then we get the fear of the Lord. And um, obeying our conscience, we've already talked about, really be sensitive to your conscience. If the Lord wakes you up in the middle of the night and tells you to go up and pray, don't make excuses, get up and pray. If the Lord tells you to um, not eat that uh, extra cake, (laughs) <laughs> it's a small thing, but it's the small things that matter. Um, then don't. Don't say, well, it won't matter just this once. You know, that's your conscience telling you. So be, be really sensitive to your conscience because the Lord will impregnate it with, with his spirit. And the, the... Do you know Isaiah 11? I like this best. I, I once had a, a, a long time where I thought, I'm just going to pray for the fear of the Lord every day until I get it. And uh, after many, many months, many months, about a year, I read Isaiah chapter 11 and it kind of leapt off the page and I I thought, this is God's answer to me. Chapter 11, this, this is talking about Jesus coming. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, Isaiah 11. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Are you delighting in the fear of the Lord today? Are you skirting around things? It's the little things that you need to look at. Let's just wait before the Lord for a minute and uh, or two. And just ask him to speak to us. And I'll pray first, then we'll wait on the Lord. And then I want you to, if you can, write down what he says to you about 
things that he's speaking to you about. Father, I thank you for our conscience and I thank you for the Holy Spirit who makes us delight in the fear of the Lord. And Lord, I pray that you open our hearts and minds this morning to what you're saying about that to us. Where have we ignored our conscience or stepped over our conscience? Where have we not been living with the fear of the Lord as if what you said was somehow less important than what we thought or felt or what someone else said? Would you please speak to us, Lord? And when he's shown you something, you quickly repent. That means just turn back to him and say, oh, God, yes, I did that wrong. Or I didn't do that. And now I'm coming back to you and I ask you for your strength. That I may live for you again. Amen. Let's also just have a look at Hebrews chapter 10. Because this is a real encouragement to you, to us all. Because it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. There's David had a sincere heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with Jesus' blood, that is, to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. <sighs> Isn't it wonderful to be able to imagine that blood of Jesus covering our guilty conscience? We don't have to feel guilty about that thing anymore. We just have to walk right. I am going to sing a song which is about holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. If you know it, please join in. Otherwise, just listen. Get right with God and do whatever you need to do. Or worship him. It's encountering him in his holiness, which is going to bring about the right attitude. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come holy 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 is the Lord thank you Lord for the blood of Jesus that sprinkles our guilty consciences Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Word of God, which as we read it, Lord, comes to life and enables us to have clean minds and clean hearts and to walk with our eyes fixed upon you. Praise you, Lord. You've done it all. 
Thank you, Lord. Amen.